sure I should put this. <laughs> I was waiting for a big introduction from Chelsea. <laughs> Kia ora koutou katoa. Greetings everybody. Um, it's our great pleasure uh, to represent Disguise amongst you all, uh, the shakers and the movers of Aotearoa gaming and film industry. Um, and fantastic to be following after Connie's um, talk, great work that Epic's doing. We've got a very close relationship um, with Epic, um, where we work kind of hand in glove. So. As this conference is all about convergence, we wanted to use the opportunity to share a little bit of background on Disguise. I think Disguise isn't so well known or understood in this market. I, I, I don't know, does anyone here know much about Disguise? A little bit, not too much. So I'm going to use the opportunity to kind of give a little background on, on the heritage of Disguise and its strong kind of history and production across like many creative storytelling formats around the world and then kind of help paint the picture of what we've begun to do here in Aotearoa in New Zealand um, with an overview on our work in XR, in VP and in the metaverse. And then my colleague Sam is going to talk through the role that Disguise plays in pr virtual production uh, kind of globally, but then, then specifically look at some of the work here and look at some of the features that are coming up on our VP roadmap. Um, so I'm Lara, um, I'm the Disguise General Manager for NZAU and I'm the Global Head of Labs. And I'd like to introduce you to my colleague and founder of Disguise Labs, um, Sam. Are you going to stand up? <laughs> he's he's going to talk soon. He'll, he'll introduce himself. Um, so I've spent the last um, three decades traversing creative arts, film production in the 90s when we actually made things on like 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter film, uh, live events in the last decade in London, managing uh, WPP teams across Europe to deliver big ideas for brands, so quite a generalist you might say, um, but creativity has always sat at the heart of everything that I've done and, and pushing the boundaries of technology has been like a, a really constant thread in my career. So I'd say that if I had to kind of summarise what my superpower is, it's to lead cross-functional teams of bringing creatives and technologists together to bring big ideas to life. And I'm thrilled to have returned to New Zealand really recently, just at the end of last year, um, to head up Disguise for the Oceania region. Introduce yourself, Sam. Um, Sam, I'm a, I call myself a creative technologist because I kind of bridge the gra gap between creativity and technology. Uh, my career has kind of spanned a decade of live events and film and television and fixed installers because you kind of become a, a multi tool in New Zealand. We don't really have specific industries like you do overseas, and it's kind of brought me overseas all around the world. Uh, ended up getting shoulder tapped by Disguise to come and help them develop XR technology and kind of because we were using their platform for a lot of our jobs um, and in 2021 I proposed a kind of R&D lab to the CEO and moved back to New Zealand to get away from the pandemic uh, and bring kind of access to this technology to Aotearoa. Uh, if I had to say what my superpowers was I would say that I drive ideas and technology by making things happen. He makes the magic happen, he really does. I'm like, where's Sam? There's not enough magic happening right now. I need Sam. <laughs> Literally. Like, how do I get this presentation to work? Um, so Disguise is a quite a powerful tool. It allows creatives to imagine, create, and deliver spectacular visual experiences. And I'm going to show you a cheesy show reel. gives you a bit of a flavour of um, some of the breadth of the kind of and scale of the of the creative 
um, that disguise touches and enables. It's been supporting creatives for over two decades, so uh, to tell large visual stories, and it, that began with a team called Unite, which were formerly called United Visual Artists, or UVA, who built software for uh, Massive Attack and U2, and that's where its roots began in kind of music, musical experiences. That went on to become D3, which went on to become uh, Disguise. So the software and the hardware is proprietary. Uh, it's a platform that now connects with over 300 kind of multi-industry kind of integrations and APIs, which brings numerous uh, industry tools all into one platform. And I think that's part of the power and the, and the kind of um, the usability that makes Disguise such a popular tool to use. So it's used for enabling anything, everything from kind of real-time live shows, location-based and immersive experiences across museums, theme parks, retail environments, immersive, interactive and experiential, uh, across many industries and verticals. Uh, it's used in a lot of Broadway and theatres, uh, now of course in XR for TV and film production, and more recently uh, we've been deploying our technology to uh, take live events into virtual spaces. So connecting virtual concerts with live audiences and of course that's kind of where everyone's pivoting kind of in the last couple of years and really pushing towards the metaverse. So three key enablers in this space which have transformed the production landscape um, for Disguise and for the industries at large. Um, Real-time 3D rendering and of course we talked, heard from Connie earlier you know, fat, um, the Epic Games has been instrumental in our development since the pandemic um, because 80% of our revenue pre-pandemic was from live events and that all dropped out in March 2020. Everything got cancelled. Um, so Disguise pivoted to XR and VP, which it had already spent a lot of time investing in, but it suddenly became kind of the hero in the toolkit. Um, Epic Games actually granted Disguise an Epic Mega Grant and then went on to become a minority stakeholder of Disguise. Um, so we do th remain tech agnostic though, despite Epic's involvement, we, we, collect, we make sure that tool is kind of useful to everybody, every creative. Um, we personally lean in our lab team very heavily on Unreal, but Unity, Notch, all tools that are important, all engines for storytellers, um, disguise supports. Real-time 3D rendering uh, requires fast GPU, so Disguise has kind of been investing a lot in its technology to supercharge with rendering nodes, to, so that w you know we're keeping up with the pace of rendering. Um, and of course, the quality of LED has been a huge um, kind of game changer, I guess, in, in this world as well. Um, and all of these things combined, and I guess what I haven't, haven't added there is spatial tracking, of course, also an important element, all enabling storytellers to deliver more immersive kind of live productions. Um, and an example of the pivot, I guess, when everything got cancelled was an example Billie Eilish's show, which kind of mid-tour um, had to then switched uh, to an XR broadcast, which Sam was on the sidelines <laughs> technically supporting, trying to kind of uh, make happen. Um, groundbreaking at the time and getting a lot of attention, but also preceded by Katy Perry's performance in American Idol, which again had, was supposed to, of course, have a live audience and had to quite quickly pivot and switch um, to an XR solution. Try to knock me down Took the sticks and stones Showed them I could build a house they Tell me that I'm crazy But I'll never let them change me So they cover me in daisies Daisies, daisies They said I'm going And I, you know, I love when when we kind of present to students and we're talking. And Sam's often been working on a lot of these big international projects at the time. And he's like, "See the yellow chair? There was an art director with this piece of string that was pulling it across in the background." And you know, a lot of these big glossy show reels, they don't tell you the real stuff that's actually happening and how much sweat everyone's dripping when you're kind of pushing that technology right to the limit of its known. Uh, kind of capability on a live moment because everyone's pivoted to new tech. So Sam's full of good stories. <laughs> so, you know, it's a really versatile tool across so many categories, live entertainment, location-based film, TV, mixed reality. Um, and just to help people understand the kind of pervasiveness of, of Disguise, the majority of stadium tours now are using Disguise from 660 and LAB, our New Zealand bands, to Beyonce and Ed Sheeran and Metallica. Um, we've got the largest location-based experiences on the planet have been powered by it. Like the, the, this is the dome, the Al Wazzle Dome at, in, um, 
in Dubai, which has got, is it 256 video projectors all connected to make, bring that beautiful dome to life. And in the past two years, um, the XR platform has generated over 600 real-time productions in 50 countries, so it's really exploded, um, including LED-based LED virtual productions for Netflix, Amazon, Paramount, uh, Warner, the list goes on. And, and that, I guess, has amounted to this month we were um, received an Emmy for our contribution to engineering, science and technology um, for, for XR. So a really kind of proud moment where all of this kind of push in the last few years has kind of got the technology to. So if we if we kind of bring all these things together, real-time show production, virtual production and XR, these are all really the building blocks if you bring them together for where we're all going next, which is, well certainly where we're going next, which is all exploring and unlocking the building blocks for the metaverse and for Web3. And those are kind of the, the rich territory for Disguise Labs. Um, labs is based up uh, our first kind of office here in New Zealand in Auckland. It's our heartland. Um, and because the technology is changing at pace and media creation and the convergence of gaming, filmmaking and broadcast is accelerating and evolving so rapidly, um, Disguise has really decided to invest in a network of labs around the world to keep pace and kind of really contribute to that to that evolution. So it's a really important strategic pillar, pillar in our Disguise toolset. Uh, we're here to push the limits of the technology through our own R&D. So rather than just kind of being recipients of information from our clients and customers that use our tech to actually be the doers and the makers to, to take that learning direct, stay abreast of industry needs, build partnerships and unlock new use cases, particularly with gaming platforms, and that's a big part of our focus from our New Zealand lab, um, and um, feeding back directly to our engineers in the UK and our production development team to evolve the platform. So we've got this lovely virtuous circle between our R&D and use cases in the market and how that feeds our, our pipeline. Um, so it's, we're primarily R&D focused, but we're also doing a bit of consulting and creation. And importantly, we're supporting a lot of lighthouse projects, particularly in the virtual production space here in New Zealand. We probably wouldn't do that in any other country, but we're absolutely doing that here because it's such a rich and vibrant um, filmmaking community here. Um, it's a perfect opportunity for us to test and evolve um, our VP offering um, and then send that back to the roadmap. So beyond the R&D, the, the, the kind of really important part is training and I heard a couple of talk, a couple of mentions this morning about diversity and about um, kind of making sure we bring that next generation through and a diverse generation through. Um, we partner with AUT, with Toro, who which is a, a Māori creative um, kind of talent pipeline and we're looking to support um, the University of Canterbury, I see Bree sitting there, uh, with the Digital Screen Campus and, and Massey to kind of help build and evolve their offerings. But essentially there is not enough talent. The, the, the talent supply is, does not, is not keeping up with the demand right now. So the only way we can really kind of keep up with the pace of demand is to just to bring the next generation through. So this is our little team of creative technology, technology ninjas in, um, in, in where well, we're not all in Auckland, we're kind of actually spread around the country but our office is in Auckland. And from here we are kind of connecting out to the world so I'm very proud, I very intentionally got a map with New Zealand in the middle because usually when the CEO uh, met me last year and he goes so there's a little map of New Zealand right on the edge of the map and we've got all these arrows going out to the world I'm like yeah I like this I don't think I've ever been in a meeting in London where someone showed me a map of the world and said New Zealand's the starting point and it's going out to the world so I was like I'll get you another map Fernando um, so just a quick skip before we go into virtual production through some of our work so XR um, a lot of it's under NDA but we're finding that a lot of our North American clients, Microsoft, uh, Airbnb, Spotify in this case, Snap, they're all looking at bringing XR into their kind of corporate toolkit. So there's a lot of just explaining to their teams, you know, what is, what's possible with, um, with AR, uh, with, you know, how they're using it for internal comms and storytelling to, to customers or stakeholders or shareholders. So XR is really exploding, not just in the entertainment uh, sector. Um, and you know, this is a customer in Jakarta who this year bought a whole lot of tech uh, for a shopping mall in, in, um, in Indonesia and then was like, I need some content. Uh, so we made them a space station. Um, but you know, just shows how that's it's really kind of pushing out into the market. 
The exciting part then, I guess, is is the web, the the, the web three kind of metaverse gaming platform territory, and we have we have a lot of fun in our lab. Uh, one of our interns earlier this year explored uh, the fantastic Unreal Engine MetaHuman creator um, and used iClone software for lip syncing to build a digital Fernando for us, a digital CEO. So when we did our we kind of joined a town hall and kind of did a fake Fernando. And, but, you know, so we're always kind of on the tools, using, learning, just kind of keeping abreast of what's coming in market. Um, and that R&D is beginning to unlock the creation of bi-directional portals, essentially, we're calling it. So, like, using disguise at this heart of connecting live audiences and performers in real life with virtual audiences. Um, this is a little metaphor here, of course, where we've got you know avatars from different gaming platforms, and that bringing that kind of the real life world, connecting it back uh, to the virtual. So we've been running a range of tests to reimagine music, because that's of course disguises heritage. Uh, reimagine music in the metaverse, working with some really amazing kind of uh, metaverse platforms globally who are all a combination of Unity, Unreal, and a whole variety of tech stacks, actually, to integrate our tech into to be Web3 enabled. Um, so this is a little, a little technical test just to bring that to life for you. This is an example where we were synchronizing our XR stage in our lab in Auckland with an XR stage in New York, where we had just some DJs playing, just some music. Just, it was just purely technical. It wasn't creative test. Just, and then sending that data up into a platform called Nowhere. Um, and some beautiful moments come from some of these tests, some unexpected moments. Um, a lot of it becomes about human connection and audiences and how we're interacting. So this is what I call now the Michelangelo moment, actually, where um, Eleanor, our mocap um, person on, in Brooklyn, in New York stage, kind of had a beautiful little high five and dancing moment with um, Grace, our one of our interns on our, st on our stage here. But you really begin to kind of, you have these little kind of uh, um, hair ting spine tingling little moments where you're like, yes, this is kind of, this is really exciting stuff, right? Um, we ran a test on Pixel Stream a few weeks ago simulating volumetric capture in real time using an Unreal environment. So kind of helping or creating spaces, and this is really just using out-of-the-box Unreal here. We're not using, this was, again, a technical test. Uh, but thinking through how we use the disguise, all the kind of visual effects triggers, and all those things that we use from a live performance, how do we bring that into a virtual environment? Um, just beginning to think through the beginnings of what does that experience feel like as, an, as a... Uh, uh, if you're arriving at a gig, what does that arrival moment feel like? Just beginning to touch on that experience design of a, of a performance. Um, oh, how do I skip past that? Um, I got my husband's band in this week. I was like, Mike, we need a real, we need a real performance, not a DJ. Can you come in? Could you come in? So um, this is, uh, you know, beginning to test. Um, act, you know, live bands, a virtual experience. What are, what are the, what is the, what's the distinction? What's our technical challenges we have to overcome to kind of make that, to make that happen seamlessly? And that brings me to virtual production. Um, so it was really exciting um, earlier this year to be part of the team who helped lift the walkers up into the clouds for the Air New Zealand uh, safety video um, to empower directors and DOPs to put the magic on our screens. Um, I've got a little video to share. When I first saw the script, I wanted to inject that magic sort of storytelling into the film that we're making. The more things I can do in camera, the more real locations, real light I use, the better it looks for me. In this case we've got a walker flying through space and above clouds which can't be done so we're using a bit of both worlds where we shoot some stuff real, some stuff in studio. One of the new technologies we're using for this is the use of LED stages, which are massive screens that allow us to create a lot of our visual effects work before we shoot it, and then literally play it back on these screens in real times as we film the actors in front of them. 
Yeah, it's a very new technology. It's been used overseas on films like Star Wars The Mandalorian, and it allows relatively limitless creative possibilities in creating virtual worlds and the ability to interact with those worlds in a controlled studio setting that isn't possible from a practical point of view. Our walk is flying above clouds, for example. We've got footage of clouds and we shoot the walker in front of it in the studio. We build the CG clouds from scratch using a volumetric system called Houdini and we literally place each cloud in the environment and create a cloud landscape really. All those clouds give off light, they give off movement, all that stuff plays quite a lot on the reflections of the walker, the, the light hitting the people and I think it gives the actors something to bounce off. It kind of helps them understand the environment they're in, the timing, create mood for them. It's really on project like this when you're trying to have a waka flying through the air at night above the clouds that you know this kind of technique and tools really comes to fruition. By having all of those visual element on set and having this amazing LED screen supporting the content and the creative, uh, we can really achieve the unachievable. We were laughing about the um, how Ollie, one of our team, got the content manager title last night. And it's been really interesting even just listening to what's the language and the naming conventions we use for this new department and these new people that are on set that we didn't have on set before and the role that they play and, and the politics of naming conventions. There's always that. Um, so Labs is supporting some really major lighthouse um, virtual productions um, at the moment. We're training, training as I said, um, a generation of skilled disguised creative te technologists for the film industry. And Megan, one of our interns, is here, Ray, uh, who's got a few months ahead of her on set. Um, Megan, amongst others, and proud to say our team is 50% women, 50% men. Uh, and Sam actually said, "Oh God, I'm, I've been asked why I've got so many coordinators on set." And he's like, "I haven't got any coordinators." On on set, what do you mean? He goes, well, what are all the women doing? Um, so message to our men in our industry, please um, help and support our women to feel um, equally kind of respected and connected on set. Um, we are all training as many women to be as technical as our very male dominated industry. Um, so these are opportunities to take learnings from these projects um, from set back to our engineers, as I said before. And I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's just going to talk you a little bit more through the VP side. <clears throat> um, I'm going to do a bit of a focus on virtual production, because uh, it's kind of, uh, it's very exciting for me and a bit of a passion, and I think at the moment it's kind of redefining filmmaking and how we make films. Um, at Disguise, we kind of envisioned a solution where all of the technologies kind of integrate into one, which has been our kind of pathway towards success over the past 20 years in live events, where we kind of become a platform or a hub where we integrate with all of the data and protocols and various departments on site so that you end up with a seamless show. Um, breaking down barriers between creative and technical implementation, this enables production teams, creatives, um, to have the creative magic working together and collaboratively um, in virtual and physical worlds, um, just like they would on location. We're seeing a, a big shift uh, in, in film towards virtual production, so you need to, and, but film, you need to be very agile and collaborative. Um, and virtual production does actually enable this. Um, it's already creating new roles, as Lara was just saying, um, and so there's kind of a, a bit of a turning point at the moment so we figure out what those roles are and what they should be called and all of that. Um, these are some recent titles that have been powered by Disguise, um, including Batman, that I think Dan is going to be talking more about in a bit later today. And then since COVID, we've seen a massive shift towards this, where I think um, <clears throat> when I first got to London, there was like maybe three volumes or three small volumes in the world using Disguise. And then I think that last count, there was like 400 or 50 or something. This is just crazy. But these are just to name a few. We've got Mal's in Montreal, MGX in Turkey, Castage in New York, Exxon in South Korea, Meptic in Atlanta, Nant in LA, and many, many more everywhere. Everyone's adopting it. And I guess that's just to show how, how quickly the technology has advanced and how quickly people are picking it up. 
kind of, I guess, the big thing about virtual production is that it's moving from post-production to real-time production, so it's shifting a whole bunch of workflows that used to happen after the fact to before, which is quite hard for film to get their head around because it does mean you're having to make a lot of decisions in a different pathway, um, decisions that normally you could make at the end of the film or wait, or um, you now have to have these stories defined before you go into it, like, very precisely. Um, traditionally, it's used VFX gra graphics in the past, but now we're bringing all of those teams into the pre, where we build all the content before, and then get to look at on set. At its most basic level, virtual production is what happens when a combination of technologies lets filmmakers replace green and blue screen shoots uh, to use LED screen panels to help with, with the help of 3D engines or 2D camera plates um, to enable to get the shots in camera. Because virtual production is the intersection of so many technologies, conversations between departments and technology providers is crucial. Um, and with disguise and our numerous integrations, it kind of becomes a, an ideal platform to kind of sync those, that data um, and link those conversations because we we've worked so closely with all of these different teams for so many years um, in different mediums. Uh, these are some of our key partners, um, to name a few mainly focused towards virtual production and how we've partnered with kind of big players, content creators, tracking systems, camera systems, LED systems, smoking tracking, um, and also lighting and various other systems. Um, if you think of real-time content rendering as a video assist to your filming, um, you get to see the LED background, the actors get to see it, you get to see the props and everything in camera and you get a real realistic idea of what that shot's going to look like without trying to imagine it with pre-rendered VFX or um, stills that you look at of what you might add into the shot later. Um, and I've kind of got five things that I think is going to, is why I think virtual production is going to be so successful. Um, Storytellers gain more than control with virtual production. They reclaim instinct because the DPs and directors can watch a scene play out in real time on the LED screen, which also immerses the actors and the props on set, which we've kind of heard everyone kind of reinforcing today. They can evaluate the shots on the fly and make quick creative decisions, um, which you can actually update in the content on the fly in real time if you need to, um, depending on what the scene or the sequence needs based on what you're seeing in camera. Working with virtual scenes allows you to control the environment you're shooting. A perfect sunset can last all day um, for as many reshoots as you deem necessary and you can come back into the exact same conditions the next day uh, and you can change the weather at the touch of a button, which is very handy for Wellington. Um, <laughs> when actors perform against LED screens, they're displaying an entire virtual world. They're literally immersed in that reality, which is the advantages of natural sight lines for them to look at. Um, interact with um, and see exactly what ha is happening in the scene and for the abilities to react to that um, and also be lit by it, be it movement or whatever. Um, this brings about a much more convincing performance, which I think as we, in all of Connie's videos about people around the world, this is what people are getting so excited about. This wholly uh, immersive production process enables directors and DPs and other decision makers to explore creative options more easily on set with the control of faster calibration workflows coming out every day and creative decisions are made on set and can be informed made fast and collaboration is important. It does also bring like everyone into the conversation. So now in the past with the um, post-production process, most of the shoot has been knocked off or they've finished the job, art directors have finished for the shoot and it's like down to whoever's left on the team or stayed on, the director, the VFX soup and that to kind of finish the final look of the film, but with in-camera visual effects it enables that kind of beast of 60 to 100 people that are there every day um, trying to bring this film to life to actually look at it in the moment and make creative decisions together. One of the biggest benefits of VP volumes is the ability for capture reflections and natural lighting of your scene um, combined with lighting techniques used, techniques used for film over years. This unlocks um, some incredible outcomes on set um, and in camera. Um, and also, maybe the most important, uh, it is um, completely reduces the need to travel to locations, which can a save productions money because you only need to send maybe your VFX soup and your DP and a camera out into the snow to get your shot, and then you shoot all in scene. But also, um, this is great for our planet. It can bring down set costs of having to build the entire set. You can just build the section that actors need to be on. Um, and travel costs. You can shoot it all in one city or one country without having to travel. 
an end to the statement, fix it in post. Uh, I think this is uh, possibly the most exciting thing, uh, which I think we're not quite there, um, probably. Um, as you saw on the Air New Zealand, I was pretty gutted because we kept putting green on the screen. But it did actually get a little bit exciting after a while because it made me realise that in-camera visual effects or virtual production isn't just in-camera visual effects. It does mean that you have the ability to. So Blockhead didn't quite finish the clouds in time um, for some of the scenes and so we didn't have final content. But we got to put up the draft renders for the DP and the lighting guy to look at it in-camera, light the scene. Actors could see what they were looking at run rehearsals and then when we went to shot we didn't have to go full green on the screen like a green screen shirt we could just put it around the actors heads or wherever our VFX supervisor said he wanted to put the tracking markers the front of the waka was very intricate so we always put it around that and things like that but it did actually having LED screen and the system on site did actually mean that um, it was still a good use case of the technology if not a bit sad we didn't get to do it uh, final in camera for some of the scenes um, Uh, just want to take a moment to talk about some future things that are coming from Disguise's point of view. Um, this year we're releasing our, at the moment our calibration workflow relies on observations taken ahead of time. We're about to release our version of Disguise that is real-time spatial and colour calibration. So we compensate for <coughs> location of screen and camera um, in real time to keep everything aligned and we also compensate for things like looking at LED on angles. When you obscure LED diodes, it can make the screen warmer or cooler. Um, and the idea being, pending some more amazing work from our developers, we'll be able to compensate for that so it um, achieves a more accurate color workflow. Um, we also have some new techniques coming for kind of linking the physical and the virtual world, which is a big focus for disguise. Um, we are always interested in how the two worlds interact. And so using um, just a one witness camera, which could be the main camera you're shooting with. Um, so Clever Devs uses computer vision algorithms to detect light sources, and without using a tracking system, we kind of, we do make a few assumptions. This isn't an exact, it's not quite an exact science, but um, we make orientation assumptions based on where the LED wall in the scene is. We assume that you're trying to shine the light at the LED wall, not at the camera. Um, and we pass these lighting parameters and generate lights in Unreal, um, and hoping to expand um, this to work out with other game engines but for now it's locked to Unreal and we add lights into the scene and then now your physical lights, i.e. a torch, and we did some tests with some candles, can generate the light to interact with your virtual world. Um, automatic map production kind of maybe a bit of the holy grail for VFX people around the world or anyone that's done any rotoscoping over the past 10 years. Um, again using just one camera, um, we can now, this is, I guess for XR this is exciting because instead of um, having to calibrate your LED to match virtual content, we can now bring the virtual content all the way into the performers and we're no longer seeing the LED through the camera. For virtual production it gets exciting because it kind of unlocks all of the green screen workflows that you've, uh, people have been used to over the years with the power of uh, in-camera visual effects because at the end of it you end up with your mat which is a starting point for maybe having to touch things up or if things need to change in a scene that you shot in camera. Um, and silhouette projection using both of these techniques um, kind of semi-combined and a second camera this one requires at a 90 degree angle. We have started to generate uh, some very low poly voxel or meshes of what's going on on the stage and we start getting an idea of depth um, in real time of where people are and how they interact with the virtual world so we can start pushing things over um, or gamifying I guess these worlds that we're using for virtual production. Um, one of the tests we did for this was um, a performer walking through grass and having the grass move from augmented reality to backplate um, on the LED and having the grass part as the as the person walks through it. So this is very exciting for kind of um, interaction with the virtual world. Um, it's only the beginning kind of, you know, except for um, was it Alfred Hitchcock in 1956 using virtual production for his plane scene, so it has been coming for quite a while. But um, 
technology has kind of got us there now, but we're kind of at a pivotal point at the moment. Everyone's kind of moving towards it, but it is kind of semi held on by duct tape at the moment and workflows that we're figuring out as we go. Um, but uh, it's got a lot of attention at the moment and we're very exciting, uh, very exciting to be a part of and take it forward. Um, thanks. Questions, um, just come to the mic here, and it's already on. So, hey, um, great to see you. Thanks. Um, what's your design um, sort of workflow for how big a wall needs to be, where you need to place it, what's the shape going to be? Um, Part of Disguise's uh, designer software is free um, and simulates everything that Disguise can do except for outputting, um, or you actually need the media service to do that. So you can do a lot of tech vis and design, you can spin up Unreal or look at your 2D plates or how, whatever your scene is and get your cameras out, put your lenses in it and kind of work through what you might look. Uh, the biggest thing I notice is the thing that people don't think about is height of screen because very quickly you can build a really, really big wide wall and then pretty much every shoot I've been on you pull the camera back and suddenly, you, and so there's a lot of like filling blue screen and behind there and um, but uh, your screens I guess every single job I've been on your screens never big enough there's always a director that wants to do that big white and um, yeah <laughs> uh, for anyone who wants to be learning more about um, virtual production tech and that technology have you found that most people are learning just on the job at the moment, or are there courses out there? Uh, so we have a bunch of educational initiatives at the moment. So as Lara said, we're working quite closely with Bree and James from Canterbury and Massey. We've been working with AUT for quite a while and Toro, um, but we're finding educational facilities are pivoting all around the world. Uh, we're talking to lots of people in um, Australia, Mexico, London, everyone is kind of pivoting to having these kind of screen campuses or at least the ability to teach it on campus. Um, we have all of, we at the start of COVID, we digitised all of our training courses into a web portal, uh, training.disguise.one, it's all free, you can go on and do all of our courses. Um, Unreal's got amazing courses online for you to learn 3D engines, so there's definitely kind of big, big pivot to kind of online learning, but also we have 10 interns uh, at Disguise because we kind of, as we look to hire people or also support our community, um, there just isn't people there that know it. So we've kind of acknowledged that and globally are hiring juniors and new people coming of uni and partnering with educational facilities to teach these workflows because we just can't fill um, or support our community or user base fast enough. Yeah, I would add that I think we're at a moment where we're in between, like whilst I just say we're in that moment in between now where educational institutions are kind of retooling and redesigning, the, you know, the learning, and but the demand's already there. So we're so I think it's a all hands on deck kind of moment in time, a little bit like when Web One began. You just learnt on the job. So I'd say we're in that space right now, but that's changing quickly. Yeah. Um, sounds like you started um, Disguise Lab, Sam. What's your, um, you know, and and what's both of your vision for where that can go? Um, so I worked for a couple of years for Disguise and support and technical kind of solutions, supporting the community, and it was very frustrating and reactionary because we'd get calls from customers like 12 hours before, three hours before doors going, we're trying to do this thing, but it doesn't, it's like, oh, it was never used to, how did you figure out how to, oh my God. And there's like all hands on deck for devs and support people to kind of come in and support to get a production across the line to like not go down, the show must go on. And so after a while of that, I kind of pitched to the CEO, it's like, we need to stop being so reactionary. We need to like live and breathe our tool set. Um, so my dream is to keep bringing in the next generation um, and just teach them I mean, we're quite lucky in New Zealand, uh, we're, we're all multi-tools, you don't really get to focus like people overseas where the industries are so big and rigid and you kind of get to focus on that one thing. And so I think creative technologists um, 
the most creative technologists I know in the world are all Kiwis because we come out of here with such a breadth of knowledge. If you do video, you learn lighting and audio, and if you work live events, you actually got a side hustle, which is film and television and fit. And, um, and so I think if we can teach that to the next generation, it's like it's good to specialise but also generalise. Um, and that's kind of my, my passion for the, for the next wee while. And, and I'll just add to that to say that I think um, it's a delicate balance how we position labs because whilst it's grown out of this kind of R&D and training kind of ethos and being close to the tools and close to our clients' work, it's also a delicate balance not to step on the toes of our of our community where we start to be in the maker space um, alongside our, our, our customers. So, um, But so far, the dividends we're already getting from a 12-month program of labs is already kind of fueling a whole lot of new thinking that we wouldn't have had. So um, that's the, the plan is to evolve that and kind of nuance it by market depending on what's happening. But I think those t- that T-shaped ca- you know, characters that will kind of talent that we're, that we're building, depth of knowledge in key areas but with good breadth is, is right really where the mar- where the mar- what the market needs right now. Um, so And because disguise are sitting across so many verticals and so many industries, it becomes a really useful knowledge tool set to it as, a, as a talent or whatever you want to call yourself as a person in your career to kind of be able to go deep but kind of stay wide as well. One more. Um, how far away do you think we are from this kind of technology being available to even kind of smaller budget productions? We saw a lot of really big films this morning in Connie's talk, but I think a lot of us are wondering, you know, how long until these smaller groups or lower budget projects will have access to this kind of tech? <laughs> well, I was just going to say that, you know, there's a project that we got asked to help. Um, in the last few weeks that we've been consulting on to support a much smaller uh, New Zealand co-production to attempt to to kind of, can they afford it is the question. Can we afford to bring uh, virtual production in to do some car sequencing essentially? And, um, you know, just the cost of getting the LED volume up and running for a few days, you know, that's kind of become a, they're like, okay, we're out. We, you know, this is, the, we're, we're, we're not there. So actually, Brie, I talked about Canterbury. I was like, well, soon you'll be able to go to Christchurch. And um, so, you know, there are some real prohibitors. Um, but I think as the, well, Sam, you can chip in here. I think as the technology scales and the accessibility, or, the, or as we kind of build big volumes that people can come in and access, potentially in educational institutions and other places so that they've got that hybrid R&D learning training and commercial um, use then it, then the accessibility gets gets more reach um, mixed with people being trained to know how to use it but Sam do you want to add to that? I think I'm going to have to take my disguise hat off to answer this question but I think um, I think some of the most exciting development comes from people that don't have any money and do anything. Uh, we're like we're constantly searching for new cool things, and I think was it okay, if you posted or Puck posted it, someone posted a video the other day of this person that wanted to recreate Ready Player One um, moment now. And if you said that to me, me and my me and our team went and put our heads back, we'd probably come back with some like kind of crazy amount of zeros on a napkin that said if you if you want to do that, and this guy did it. Two weeks ago, it took him eight months and it cost him like $18,000. He went out and like found places that had haptic gloves and this and that and VR headsets and this. And his biggest hurdle was like none of these technologies interface with each other, which is putting my disguise hat back on, where we come into the mix a lot of the time and why we're so expensive is because it's like years and years of development of like interfacing with crazy protocols that shouldn't talk to each other. Um, but somehow this guy managed to do it and he built his little home rig, put his VR headset on and is probably one of the only people in the world that has experienced uh, Ready Player One. And actually that's a really nice reminder about partly the role that Labs is playing. You're asking about the purpose of Labs. You know, it's like, you know, there's so many people who say, just come and check out our lab in Kingsland. There's an LED wall there if you want to try it, use it, test it. And that is, I think, part of the purpose of labs is to kind of, because accessibility and reach is a really important pillar for disguise as well. How do we democratise access? Um, And I think labs has got a really key part in that. So we have a small volume in Kingsland and Auckland. And if anyone wants to come and try something or test something or shoot something or... um, you're very welcome. So yeah, and I think it just it needs places like that to kind of make make it reach out.
Uh, can we give Laura and Sam one more round of applause?